we should be able to get into a lot of topics uh, pretty deeply this week, and um, it's just an opportunity to save th thousands of years of learning. Because uh, when you go deep into the metaphysics and you start to have insights about how it relates to your everyday life, and I call it the top 40, those thoughts that just recur over and over, if you have any recurring thoughts or issues, those are just uh, opportunities or those are, are topics and thoughts that are just waiting to be uh, dissolved. And when we come together like this, it's really a good opportunity. We do have a lot of movies that deal with the idea of no private thoughts, and you might say that um, the definition of a private thought would be any thought that you have about the past or the future. Uh, these are also sometimes called uh, hypothetical thoughts. Hypothetically speaking, as if in the future something may or may not occur. And if you really just watch your thoughts as they roll through, you see there's a lot of hypothetical thoughts, or what the Course would call private thoughts. And some of them are judged to be very desirable, and uh, that's why you think about them over and over, because they're very desirable. And some of them are very fearful and worrisome, and there's a lot of doubt attached with them, and anger and guilt. and. Uh, the positive ones about the past and the future and the negative ones are all the same, even though they seem to be very different. Uh, they are all part of, of a device to keep you from experiencing the present moment. So, so I would say that, that the journey to enlightenment or the journey to self-realization is, is voluntarily, willingly, and hopefully gently uh, letting those thoughts come up into your mind and starting to have the willingness to say, okay, these thoughts are no longer serving me. I don't really need them for survival, I don't need them uh, for a sense of well-being, and that it's possible for me to just relax and sink into the present moment and experience everything that I could ever want or ever need in this very moment. And that's what the spiritual journey is about, is learning to just live in the present moment. And trust, because it takes a lot of trust to let go of those thoughts. Because the belief is that those thoughts serve to bring about safety, security, uh, and many, many kind of desirable things, when in fact it's like a wheel. You just keep thinking about them over and over and over. And it's, the wheel does not bring peace of mind. It's the wheel is, is almost like the karmic wheel, they call it, or the wheel of distraction to keep you away from the present moment. Now the Holy Spirit knows that the mind, when it's asleep, is heavily invested in these thoughts. And even though in reality there are no private thoughts, the condition of seeming to be in this world is to believe in those thoughts, as if they're reality. So, you will notice that there are so, a lot of emotions that are connected to those thoughts. And that's why it can seem like the human condition is just an emotional roller coaster ride of up and down. People will even say, life is meant to be a series of challenges, and you will have challenges every day based on these thoughts and these emotions. But actually, life was created by God to be perfect happiness, that if we had to give a definition of God's will, it would be God's will is for perfect happiness, not for a roller coaster ride of emotions. And so, it seems to take a lot of mind training to allow those thoughts to come into awareness and then to be willing to not protect them, not push them down and repress them, to deny them, but just to let them come into awareness and then to let them go and give them to the Holy Spirit. And one of the questions that comes up the most often is, how do I do this? And I would say that the basic teaching of the Course is Jesus just saying, try not to interfere. 
In other words, that's, that's all you have to do is not interfere with something that's already a movement of healing that is occurring always, all the time, and it's not like you have to learn some special formula or a certain steps that you have to take all the time, but it's like by not protecting those thoughts in your mind, then they are voluntarily over offered, opened to the Holy Spirit for healing. And there's no sense of needing to do anything special uh, to release those things. And you don't even have to go on a witch hunt and try to find out uh, what they are. Just your daily experience as you move through this world, you have plenty of opportunities of those thoughts, dealing with those thoughts. So it's not like a, you have to go on a search and destroy mission or something uh, with the Holy Spirit. You just have to to be willing not to protect those thoughts as they come up. When you say thoughts, does that mean whether they're expressed or not? I mean, we, there's a lot of things in the past and in the future that you that you, you know that you're attached to, and and you can express it. Is that still a kind of thought? Yeah, it's it's by its very nature. Uh, they can be, seem like thoughts, they can seem like memories, when we talk about the past, we can talk about memories that we seem to have experienced. Um, they can seem to take the form of plans, you know, when you're looking forward to things and you're planning things out. And you might say that, that you're opening up to a completely different experience than you've ever had before, and so the deeper you go, the more you see how all-encompassing this uh, ego defense mechanism is. That it's, it's not like a lot of spiritualities where we were taught to, you know, you know, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. You know, that's a common thing that t people talk about on the spiritual path, is if you can just el eliminate the negative and then have only positive thoughts in your mind. but but the positive thoughts and the negative thoughts are part of a continuum, and it's the very continuum that's the block. And that's why you can't just affirm your way back into reality or, or the Kingdom of Heaven. In fact, the, the man we met right before we started here, Peter, who came over from a nearby ashram, he was saying, he was listening or to was it Louise Hay, a, a yes. book or... Mm -hmm something with Louise Hay, and, and he was talking about a lot of affirmations, and he was saying that he's actually in a part of his path where he's, he turns the affirmations into a question. Uh, maybe something more like, um, like Byron Katie's work, where you take a look at fundamental questions about your thoughts. Is this really true? Is it so? Uh, instead of having an affirmation and just repeating an affirmation, it's more get, getting down underneath to Ah, oh, is this belief that I have really so? And, and that's a way of opening your mind to what, what is real and true, by questioning the false. So, it, it is very all-encompassing, but it's it actually, uh, it gets more and more humble as you go along, because the deeper you get into spirituality, you really start to get this feeling that you really don't have a clue about this world. It seems disorienting, it seems like confusing, you may feel like I must be doing something wrong because why am I feeling confused or disoriented? I'm supposed to be clear and have a sense of certainty, but on the way to that certainty there's going to be a, a lot of ambiguity, a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty. And you might say that um, it's like when people ask me the question about, what is God's plan? You know, you hear things like, God's plan or something. Is this supposed to be some kind of a script, uh, or some kind of a scenario that, that my life is supposed to look like? Is this supposed to be, take a certain form, you know? Is God's plan for me to be a writer, or to be an artist, or something like that? And in, in the most basic way, you could say that God's plan is just a state of mind. It doesn't really, it's really actually independent of what seems to be going on in form. And so that's why it's very frustrating when people are looking for their calling, 
or they're saying, God, show me your plan, because they want sometimes a vision or a perception. That's why people go to psychics, you know, it's like, I want to know, you know, how is my life going to play out? Am I going to be single or married? Am I going to have children? Where am I going to live? What am I going to do for a profession? You know, it's like going to a psychic and then having a, a psychic or a seer uh, kind of look into the, the record, Akashic records, and see, oh, let's see what you did. Oh, you did this. And it's supposedly, if you find out that information, is that supposed to make you eternally happy? Uh, even knowing that information, there still will, would seem to be struggles, because God's plan is not a script. God's plan is a state of mind, and that you embrace and achieve God's plan when you embrace this peace of mind. When you're, when you're at peace, you are smack dab in the middle of God's plan for salvation, no matter what the form looks like. So that's probably going to be a theme that we could explore in the sense that, that ultimately when you are still holding on to the ego, you will still make up pictures in your mind of what peace w must look like. Even when you say to people the words, world peace, you know, then people have different images in their mind about what world peace would look like. Maybe like that old Coke commercial we know, everyone holding hands, like to teach the world to sing perfect harmony, you know. Or we had a thing, hands across America, everyone joins hands, or Michael Jackson, you know, we are the world, we are the children, you know, everybody's got some kind of vision or some kind of a song or something associated with how it would look. And what I'm saying is, when you train your mind to join with the Spirit, you come into such alignment with the purpose, with the Spirit's purpose, that, that what the world seems to look like is completely irrelevant. To that peace of mind. It's like Jesus, you know, looking from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. You could apply that to the whole world. He wasn't just talking about the ones that were, that may be laughing at him, or the ones that had just uh, driven spikes through his arms and his legs, but it was a perception where he saw that the world of images had no meaning whatsoever, and that that those images, regardless of how they seemed to look, that peace of mind was completely independent of, of that picture. Because the perspective had shifted. There was a little tiny tweak in the mind where the perspective shifts from linear to uh, simultaneity, where everything is not a linear script anymore, but it's like all simultaneous, and in that little tweak in the mind, that's where the peace comes. It's not about achieving it or attaining it in the world, or thinking that there's some kind of quantitative measure, uh, that if so many people in so many countries uh, reached a, a point of, of peace, that uh, suddenly we would have it. It's like, it's just a tweak in your own mind, or in the mind that brings about this, this peace. And people often get into those questions about manifesting, in other words, manifesting peace or manifesting happiness and so forth, manifesting abundance. Um, basically, the deeper you go, you can see that all this idea of using the power of the mind to manifest something in the world in a specific way is just a stepping stone idea, because what you're moving into and towards is a state of mind that is completely unified, and you see that everything is mind, that nothing is physical, that everything is in mind. And in that state, of course, there's peace, because there is no conflict, there is no duality. There is no thought and manifestation of thought, which is still tunis, or duality. It's just that everything is thought, everything is mental, everything is energy, you might say in quantum physics terms. And in that sense of the unified field, or the unified mind, then that is the whole goal of spirituality, is just to be that state of mind where everything is completely unified. 
So, that, if you start to, to look at your life, you can start to see, well, the practical aspects of this mind training is just enormous, because it's not like you have to change anything in the world at all. You don't have to fight against anything, you don't have to make anything different, you don't have to try to fix anything or change anything, but you do have to be willing to allow the spirit to guide you into making that little tweak, that little change of point of view in the mind, change of perspective, which gives you the peace that you've been desiring. And that's what we'll talk about on this weekend, is just opening to that tiny little tweak. So simple that it's, it's like a, a feather blowing off a table. You know, it's something so soft and simple like that, it's not this, it, it's, it's a major experience, but it's just, it can be that eff effortless. Uh, just completely relaxed. And that's what all the mind training is for, is to come to that, that change of perspective. So the first step in coming to that perspective, which is a huge step, is to just be willing to open up to the idea that the only problem that you have is a perceptual problem. The only problem that you have is is the way that you are viewing the world. That's it. And the reason that that seems to be such a huge leap and a huge step is because the ego has made up this entire cosmos to make it seem as if that, that statement is not true. That there are problems that come every day, that come on so many different levels, um, interpersonal relationship problems, pr problems with the environment, temperature, germs, noise, uh, you know, just ozone layer, you know, ecological problems, problems between nations, problems in local government, you know, all the seeming range of problems. And the teaching is very simple, is like that those are all just a distracted device to try to make it seem so overwhelming and so complex that you'll just settle into a, a, state, a state of uh, the status quo or I just have to, you have to take the good with the bad, uh, nobody's perfect, you know, the human condition is basically saying there are lots of problems. And the best you can do is try to manage the ones that come your way and get ready for the next group and then the next group and the next group. Which can be very depressing <laughs> to think that that's all that there is. So that's what we're going to also look at today is to start to begin to open up to this idea that, that there's only one problem and it's a perceptual problem. And I would say, in fact, that the problem has already been solved, that's the good news, uh, too, that, that, which would mean that you have no problems if you put those two together. If the only problem is a perceptual problem and it's already been solved, then, then you know, you're in good shape. <laughs> but it's getting there. Yeah. Yeah. It's the joy of it. I mean, that's why I really enjoyed going around the world. Because it's like, I'm, I show up with this, this joyful, gleeful state of mind, which basically says, there's aren't, there aren't any problems at all. And then, and basically it's an invitation when somebody says, well, I have a problem. And then we start to really take a close look at it. You know, actually, is it really a problem? And the deeper you go into it, you know, you, you'll find that the problems are, are really hypothetical. You know, that, you know, right here and right now, everything is perfect. And it's only when you think about the past, wish something was different, you know, than it was, something could have been better, something could have been different, and so forth. Kind of like lamenting the past. Like, hmm, I gave it a go, but it really wasn't my best shot, or it didn't work out as well as I would have liked, or something like that. Or, 
worries and concerns and anxieties about the future, which is another common angle of thinking about where is this heading, um, you know, thinking that something from the past that you were not, uh, it was not enjoyable at all, could recur in the future. That's another fear that comes up, you know, preventing an occurrence of something that you didn't like. So, it's really beautiful when you start to just be willing to come together and say, hmm, maybe I really don't have any real problems, but we don't encourage to just kind of gloss it over and kind of affirm that. It's just, let's examine it really closely and see, is it really so that there are problems? Does it take a long time to get to that point where you become joyful from um, realizing that you know, uh, obstacles that are coming up are thoughts that you've created? And you were saying before, it's like these challenges, they, they come and then you, you kind of look at them and let them go and then you all come. When, when do you get past that to that really joyful Feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's what we call transfer of training. In other words, we'll talk about a principle, and, and even a miracle is like a principle, and then to the extent that you seem to make exceptions to the divine principle, is that to the extent that it will seem to take time to realize that state of mind. So that's why it's such a time saver because. You know, people walk around and they feel like, it's almost like walking around with blinders on, thinking, well, I've got this certain set of problems that I'm dealing with on a daily basis that are very different from everyone else, but it's actually the same. Everyone's going through different forms of the same error, and that's what makes it seem so complicated. But once you start to realize, when you come and share in a group, for example, the Spirit orchestrates exactly who's here, There'll be parallel experiences that are going on as a speed up, so you can start to see it. Uh, you were mentioning like the last retreat we had where you met Therese and then now you've become close friends and you know it's part of the speed up uh, when you join together with people. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's not so much a matter of, of time as it is a matter of willingness. And what I mean willingness, when I say that I'm saying that the willingness not to hide and protect uh, certain thoughts and beliefs. And that's what makes them seem to be unconscious, is because they've already been judged as terrible, as wrong. And so it's like they've been pushed out of awareness and then there's a mask, the personality that, that the mind wears. So it's got the personality mask on and it's got this these underlying beliefs and thoughts that it's too afraid to face and expose. Because it believes they're real. And it believes that those are real issues and that it's only going to be so willing to expose those. But once they are exposed, then they become laughable. And it's almost like this feeling like, I can't believe I held on to that for so long under this idea that if people knew about this or these thoughts, they wouldn't even want to be around me. But this takes it more to that place of, ah, these are just unreal thoughts that I've held on to and I've protected. So it's, a, it's like a feeling when people come together in their sta a state of non-judgment, then, oh my gosh, you should hear the issues that people talk about. I mean, if we recorded all these on a, a camera, some of them would be R-rated or X-rated. <laughs> uh, stuff that comes up, it's quite amazing, all the stuff uh, that comes up, and it's also quite miraculous to see all the laughter and uh, happiness and relaxation that, that comes too when, um, when people start to realize these thoughts are not what they thought they were. There's a lightness that comes with it. I have a, yeah, a, an issue which seems to be with me all the time and always comes up. Yes, I can, I can explore and gain my peace of mind and expose private thoughts with certain groups of people or in certain situations, but with that group of people, no, I can't do that, or there's a fear. 
And so there's a sense that, that this set of circumstances is holding you back from that set of circumstances. Um, and so then there's this push and pull going on, which is really frustrating. Um, and it's like, well, if I was with those people all the time, yes, I could really get, change the perceptions uh, and, and be in integrity in that. But because I'm with these people, I can't. And so there the seems to be, that's a real block, a, a real block. And, and when you say you don't struggle with it, you, you don't push it along, how, how then do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good example of, of how the ego makes it seem like it's, it's safer and it's more comfortable and there's less vulnerability in certain groups or with certain people than with others. And yet, um, that's again kind of projecting out it into form as if, uh, as if it would seem like you could be much more peaceful and happy in certain circumstances and with certain people than with others. Mm -hmm. And that kind of divides the world, you know, into, again, it's the we and the they. It's the we would maybe the ones that are I'm comfortable with and the they are the ones that I'm not. Um, and so, what it is though, is there's still an ego control mechanism that's still seeing it in personal terms, instead of just seeing it in terms of just thoughts. And it's the persona, it's the mask, that seems to be vulnerable. In other words, it's the mask that seems to be safer in some groups or with some people than others. But this mask is just something that was made up. It's like a cover over the real you. And the only way to reach the real you and to feel a sense of invulnerability or constant happiness and safety is to let go of the mask, the personality self, and the world that seems to surround the personality self. And what I mean by let go of it is, is let go of uh, the, the belief that those thoughts are really who you are, and, and the validity of those thoughts, and the validity of the, the world that seems to surround you, um, the environment, thinking that there are real environmental uh, concerns that are all based on this lie, this past learning, all these past associations. So that's the reason why it seems like a big issue, is because uh, it's like Jesus in the Course of Miracles says, um, uh, what does healing cost you? It costs you the whole world you see. Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting phrase. The healing costs the whole world you see, meaning the whole distorted world that you see that you have believed is real, that you believe you know something about, uh, that's all going to have to give way. You know, the dam is going to have to break at some point, and it's just going to have to start to be like this realization of, okay, it's not, the world is just not what I thought it was. So, the spirit knows that it seems to be a big deal, so that's why there's, it's graduated, and it's, you actually can feel maybe more comfortable talking and exposing things in a group like this than you could in some other groups, the family circles or the certain friends and so on and so forth. Um, they, they, those people may seem shocked actually if you would bring up certain <laughs> topics because they're just kind of beyond the norm, you know, outside, out of bounds. Whereas um, it can feel much more safe and secure to do it in a group like this it's still magical, you know, it's still uh, temporary, but it's a, a very helpful uh, temporary stepping stone. So, it's, so you shouldn't feel like, uh, I should be able to do this everywhere, uh, because you're working with what, where your mind's at right now, and you're working with what you do believe in. And the only way I would say, in the end, where this frustration and doubt and this block falls away, is, is when you actually have an experience that you are everywhere. Uh, that there is no limits in, in your identity. You literally exist everywhere, so to speak. 
there's no sense of um, of individuality in that state of mind, though. So there's there's it's not a concern about uh, it being a front to other people because there really are no other people in that state of mind. It's a state of mind that's all encompassing and all expansive and, and completely vast because there's no uh, sense of individuality or personality with it. So the step towards that is um, it's just doing what we're doing here and when issues like you're talking about come up or even more specific issues come up and you're able to voice them, there's nothing special about voicing them, but, but symbolically if you're able to voice them with one person or in a group like this, that's very symbolic that you're not hiding them at all from the Holy Spirit. And that's a good sign because remember you're just not to interfere with this healing that's going on. So that's a very good sign. So when something comes up and it feels as though it's right to say it, that's, that's part of all the healing. You, you, you don't actually stop that. Yeah. Because yeah. that's a private thought being exposed. Yeah. Right. It's symbolic of, of that. Mm -hmm. It's like there's nothing special about the words or vocalizing it or verbalizing it, but, but again, it gets down to the motive. If you then, like most people on the planet, hiding, your whole life, uh, it's good to turn the tables in the other direction. And to, again, to be guided, there can be a context for verbalizing that and bringing it up. Uh, some people have just tried to just begin talking about it in all kinds of circumstances without any kind of discernment, and it, it turns into a disaster, you know. So that's, that's not what we're talking about.